surprising decision by Denver City Council now has statewide implications. Last week, Council voted to end its contracts with two private companies that run halfway houses in the city. That vote led to an uncomfortable committee hearing at the state capitol today where public safety chiefs didn't have their answers. Lawmakers were asking. So is a special session needed here? Is there a public safety concern? Politics guy Marshall Zellinger walks us through how a local issue just blew up statewide. What is a halfway house? Denver City Council voted to end the halfway house contracts with two private companies last week, GEO and Core Civic. Together, those companies house 500 plus people. How did they get there? They're either transitioning from prison back into the community or a judge sentenced them directly to the halfway house. According to the head of the Colorado Department of Corrections, 60% of prisoners get released straight out of prison when their sentence is done. About 40% get out of prison a little earlier and transition into a halfway house. What does that mean? Let's let the executive director of the Department of Corrections explain. It does allow an opportunity for someone to get a job, to go to their work, and then come back to the community corrections facility at night. So it is a, intended as a step-down option back to the community. When Denver City Council canceled its contracts with the Denver halfway houses, that put the fate of more than 500 people in question. Will they be sent back to state prison or Denver County Jail? Will they be released earlier than they should be? What started as a Denver City Council decision is now rippling into a statewide concern. So that brings us to today's committee hearing at the Capitol. Lawmakers wanting to know how the state needs to respond to this and if it could cause a special session to find some new money for prisoners they weren't expecting. Marshall continues our coverage. Is there anything that's stopping these facilities from shuttering tomorrow? I mean, in a short answer, no. This state legislative committee has no power over what Denver City Council did across the street last week. The inability for anybody's forethought of the implications of the decision being made was something that was sorely missed in that meeting. This committee is about reducing the state's prison population, which may have to increase. These unassuming halfway houses in different parts of the city may shut down, leaving 517 people in a pinch. They might have to go back to prison. In the short term, there's just really no way to handle uh, that, uh, that uh, inmate population coming back to us. Currently, those transitioning in these halfway houses are not going anywhere. The companies are still operating for now. But with the uncertainty, these public safety chiefs are concerned about public safety. If clients were to feel as if it was going to be an abrupt shutdown, they'd rather take their chances and walk away, then go back to prison. Part of community corrections is getting them assistance for mental health issues, dependency issues. We want to get those individuals the help they need and deserve. Some of them commit crimes because they have mental health issues, not because they're criminals. This hearing heard about the impact on prisons, the prisoners, and the safety in the city of Denver until this moment. I haven't heard any of you mention the impact on the victims of the offenders in these two facilities. What do you anticipate is the impact specifically around notification and safety planning? Who would like to take that? All right. It's interesting being part of a meeting where you're not the one asking the tough questions. You're watching the tough questions being asked. Those public safety chiefs have been invited back to that same state legislative committee in two weeks to provide answers to some of those questions that they didn't even have the answers for right now. But really, this goes back to Denver City Council, Steve, and Denver City Council will have to work with the city of Denver to figure out what the next step is, whether they're going to try to figure out a new contract with these private companies or try to find new places to transition inmates before they come back to the community. How did they even work on this without a contract in place? We were asking Troy Riggs about that after that hearing and apparently the contract had expired at the end of June, so they were already working without a contract, and then it just got quashed by city council. There's no handshake agreement. They just continue to do the work, and I believe they're going to get paid out of the Department of Corrections fund or, or money that comes from the Department of Corrections and not from the city of Denver. So that's an interesting question that I'm still not, I haven't wrapped my head fully around, but they're still getting paid the contractors that the Denver city council said, we don't want to do business with you anymore. Hmm. Still a lot to sort out with this. Mm -hmm. Marshall, thank you. So, shocker here, Denver International Airport is denying a claim by the developer of the Great Hall project that concrete inside the airport is weak. Great Hall Partners, the developer, filed a compensation claim with the airport last month. They want to add, or they want more money and they want more time to complete this project because of what they call weak concrete on level five of the terminal. Though we don't know how much money and we don't know how much time because the developer will not let the airport make that claim public. Great Hall Partners is now requesting a formal process to dispute that claim. 
The debate over the future of Tom's Diner has a lot of people in our city weighing property rights over the character of a community. The owner of the diner submitted an application to demolish his building and the community members filed an application for historic landmark status. It has a lot of people raising questions about the whole historical landmark process. And now the city council is looking at making some changes. If you don't already know the story of Tom's Diner, here it is briefly. After 20 years, Tom Messina planned to retire and sell his valuable property on Colfax to fund his retirement. But when he applied for a permit to demolish the building, someone stood up and requested historic status for it. That's how the process works in Denver. Once you file for a demolition permit and the city deems your property may have historical significance, people in the community have 21 days to request the landmark status. If at least one person does, the process is paused for an extra week. So essentially the city has 28 days to decide. But council is looking at changing that because of cases like Tom's. What we're proposing is that instead of extending it to 28 days, it would be extended to a total of 60 days and that 60 days would provide that opportunity for some collaboration. Kara Hahn is a city planner with Denver Landmark Preservation. Her team is suggesting these changes. First, they suggest that instead of one person, three people should have to submit their intent to seek historic preservation status for a building. Once they do, the time should be extended to 60 days, which would include a mandatory meeting between the owner of the building and the people who want to save it. The goal, see if they can come to an agreement that wouldn't need a historic designation. Our intent was to weigh both property rights and community needs um, to come together with something that was a collaborative approach. So Hans Task Force is also suggesting a new criteria for preservation among architecture and history. They want to add cultural significance. Believe it or not, the city was looking at this long before the Tom's Diner situation. Things just kind of fell into place this way. Council is going to be briefed on that proposal tomorrow and will likely act on them in September. An assistant fire chief at South Metro wanted to make sure the people joining his firefighting family would have a better chance of avoiding cancer. So Chief Troy Jackson has been very open about his own battle and that his cancer is terminal. And now it's spread to the point Chief Jackson says it's time to step down. His colleagues said, you never guess what's going on when you talk to him, which is exactly the way he was, he was when he was featured in a storyteller segment last year. Now happy, joking, some great perspective. He worked on new protocols like washing off right after a fire and changing out of dirty gear right away to stop carcinogens from smoke and exhaust from trucks from settling into the firefighter's skin. 14 other South Metro firefighters are also fighting cancel, cancer. Chief Jackson, who oversees operations, is working on figuring out when his last day will be. The Brighton City Clerk's Office says a petition to recall, recall the city's mayor has enough valid signatures to put it up to the voters. The petition to recall Mayor Ken Kreitzer accuses him of overcharging Brighton residents for water and then firing the city manager to cover it up. He denies that, says the firing was a personnel issue. The city clerk's office says anyone against the recall has until August 20th to file an official protest against the petition. If no one contests it, the recall will go before voters in November. Let's play a game. It's called Name a Colorado Democrat Running for U.S. Senate. Perhaps you just said Mike Johnston or Andrew Romanoff, Alice Madden, Dan Baer, John Walsh. There's a good chance some of you even said John Hickenlooper. No, he's still not running. How many of you said Stephanie Rose Spaulding? Spaulding is the focus of this attack billboard near the Denver Aurora border on Parker Road and Iliff. Now, she ran for Congress in Southern Colorado last year and lost to seven-term Republican Doug Lamborn. The NRSC, the National Republican Senatorial Committee, is focusing on Spaulding as too liberal and not Johnson or Roman, Romanoff or Madden or any of the other candidates you might have named first. So why did they choose Spalding? According to the NRSC, because she is too liberal for Colorado. We should point out the NRSC is also running these billboards in other states with competitive Democratic primaries like Georgia, North Carolina, and Maine. She's 82 years young and still looking for an adventure. She found one on one of Colorado's rivers. Teenagers in Denver gave us a glimpse into their lives after one of the deadliest attacks against Latinos. Adults in their community know a similar fear and worry. I think a lot about the students that I taught, um, all of whom were Latino. And I think about like what it means for me to set an example for them. 
They share their lives with us next. How about this for a Monday? Not bad, right? Sunshine, no severe storms to track thus far, and temperatures comfortable, not too hot. We could be looking at records in the triple digits, but we're upper 80s to about 90 degrees, and that's what we'll see for most of this week. All the heavy thunderstorms are down to the south, and even those storms around Colorado Springs, Alamosa, and Walsenburg, they're producing rain and lightning, but there's not anything severe with that uh, weather pattern that's developing to the south of us, and that's going to be the trend for the next couple of days. Isolated storms south tonight and then a few more storms off to the east of us tomorrow. Bit of a dry line might set up between Sterling and down toward the Burlington area, but I think in Denver we're just kind of on the fringe of the thunderstorm activity. So enjoy a nice way to kick off your Monday and your week with quiet weather. 57 the low tonight with clearing skies. Upper 80s tomorrow. Isolated storms are possible south and east. Better chance of storms Friday into Saturday, but even then not overly impressive. Just a nice quiet summer week of weather. So we'll enjoy it and and if the weather's quiet here, it may not be where you're going. So don't forget, you know, Steve, the nine news weather app is super cool with the new radar and it's interactive and you should check it out. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll download, I have it on my phone right now. I thought you would. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> People are spending a whole lot of money in Colorado. Travel spending reached a new high in 2018, according to a new report obtained by Nine Wants to Know. So Kyle says you'll probably only need one guess on where most of that money was spent. The Colorado Tourism Office says the $22 billion in travel spending was about a 7% increase over 2017. Half that money was spent on overnight stays in the Denver metro area. About a quarter of the money came from trips to the high country. The Tourism Office figures that travel spending supports more than 174,000 jobs in our state and brings in more than a billion dollars in taxes. 61% of the tourism-generated taxes goes to local governments. If that money disappeared, and taxes had to be raised to make up the difference, it would cost the average family in Colorado $806 a year. Any agency or company that advertised travel helped increase travel spending in Colorado in 2018. That's local government agencies, hotels, ski resorts. But the state tourism office did spend the most, $8 million last year to market the state nationally. Over the years, they've changed their strategy from marketing certain areas to targeting more high-spending travelers. It's been a week since one of the deadliest attacks against Latinos. The shooting has left fear that children and adults share. There's a lot of anxiety. But they still want to share hope. 
I've been very pleasantly surprised um, to see how many members of my family are really listening and really doing their best to make the world a better place around us. That's next. It's been a week since the deadly mass shooting in El Paso, Texas that targeted Latinos. But the fear left in the, in the Latino community after that shooting is still there. We recently heard from young folks, teenagers whose lives have changed because of the violence aimed toward them. But the impact spreads across generations. Adults who are teachers, friends, and parents share how they feel. My name's Marissa, and I live here in Denver. My name is Gerardo Munoz. I'm a public school teacher in the city of Denver. I teach high school social studies. My name is Cecia Guadarrama Trejo, and I'm a housing organizer with 9 to 5 Colorado. How do you feel in public? After the shooting that happened in El Paso, I have definitely have felt more concerned about the spaces I'm in. It's scary sometimes when you're just out in public feeling really exposed. I think that um, just the climate around us where you feel like literally anything could happen at any time. Um, it's a little scary, so there's a lot of anxiety uh, going out in public for me. Do you avoid doing or saying certain things because of the current culture? I think a lot about the students that I taught, um, all of whom were Latino, and I think about like what it means for me to set an example for them and what it means for me to show up. Has there been an instance where you felt someone has looked at you differently? 
Yeah. It, so most of the time, it's just a matter of um, the tone of voice people use with you. you know, I took a road trip recently, and I had to stop at a gas station. And I do think that I was kind of looked at like, you know, you're an outsider, um, you're not from here. And if I'm with my family or with friends, it's usually not that much of an issue. But when I'm out on my own, I feel like there's a certain tone of voice people use with me, some impatience, um, some sort of uh, condescension that I get. I felt that sense of just, you know, being looked at as, as other and was not comfortable. Do you feel differently because of the current culture and rhetoric to where the Latino community? It's super surprising to hear this rhetoric in 2019. It's one thing in 1848. I think if you are a Latino, I think if you're an immigrant, there has always been a fear that who we are and what we represent to a lot of people is something that naturally incites some hatred towards us. Do you talk to your family about any of this and how? Um, definitely we do. I have, you know, younger siblings and a lot of youth that's in my home. And so I think, you know, with my siblings, they just ask a lot of questions and I try to be as direct and honest as I can. I talk to my family quite a bit about what happened in El Paso. I grew up really close to El Paso, just five hours away from the U.S.-Mexico border. We are able to say our love for each other um, transcends anything that's happening in our political b views. And so I've been very pleasantly surprised um, to see how many members of my family are really listening and really doing their best to make the world a better place around us. Um, I, feel like, I feel like that's what we all should be doing at this point. The conversation doesn't end here. You can hear more of their conversation on the Next YouTube channel. We want to hear from you, too. Email next at 9news.com or use the hashtag HeyNext. Crossing off an adventure on her bucket list at 82, she is teaching us all to have a little bit more fun. That's next.
So we all have a bucket list, right? For one Longmont woman, whitewater rafting was something that she had always wanted to do. And this weekend, 82 year old Deanna Maxwell crossed the item off her list. Deanna jumped into a raft with her daughter and her daughter's fiance and took part in one of Colorado's most extreme sports. They rushed down the Arkansas River through Bighorn Sheep Canyon on a two hour ride. I know a lot of people that were standing around. I mean, they were all anywhere from teenagers to early 30, I guess. I was getting these looks from people like, really, <laughs> she's gonna do this? <laughs> I wasn't all that nervous, but it, but like I said, when the big when the big ones when I could see these big ones coming, it was pretty hairy for a while. But but it was fun, and and you know I'd do it again. It was fun. So it's easy to tell that Deanna's not slowing down anytime soon. She says when she turns 90 years old, she's going to go skydiving, no matter what her doctor tells her. Some feedback now. Trey in Denver wanted to know uh, about the rules with bikes or with uh, excuse me with scooters and sidewalks. So they're very strange in Denver right now. You basically, if it's 30 miles an hour or less on the street, you can ride in the street. Uh, if not, you, get, you can ride on the sidewalk. They're hoping to clear that up. See you next time.